The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre-recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you the talk station faith matters and welcome to our program for this week i'm ben ball along with reverend robert cornegay and bishop doc loomis and uh let's get started gentlemen morning ben hope you're doing well yes sir all right uh, well we uh, want to start with the the story out uh, this past week about uh, the passing of muhammad ali and certainly something that uh, as we recording this a little bit earlier in the week um this is one of those um, stories that has gained a worldwide attention, obviously. He was, uh, at one time, the most recognized person in the world. Uh, and and uh, he had uh, an effect on a lot of people that seems to go way beyond his sports um, persona as a champion uh, boxer. Uh, I, I, I became a fan of boxing, probably, through watching Ali. I mean, I probably remember... I remember actually uh, the other day reading the Durham Morning Herald. The morning uh, I was like six, six, seven years old, uh, reading it, or maybe maybe a little bit older, reading it um, uh, when the uh, when he beat Sonny Liston. So, uh, and and uh, and that controversy around that, and uh, uh, just became a fan of boxing probably, probably through that, and probably a lot of people did. Mm-hmm. Um, it was um it, it was a remarkable fighter to watch, but the personality behind it. Uh, became the one of the first big sports personalities for what he said more than what he did. So, but let's look at the, look at this because as a, as a Christian, we also look at his uh, allegiance uh, at the time uh, to the nation of Islam, and then other things as well too. So, what was your Im- impression? Um, oh, well, I guess the reason the question first the question I want to ask besides looking at a few articles here, and there are many of course, uh, but is how is it that this this person who's a boxer became a persona that was larger probably larger than life but then also very beloved across this country and across the world what was it about him that that had that sort of mystique to it I've thought about that a lot this uh, this week, and and what did you come up with? <laughs> well, I I do think I do think that he had an a, a, an aura about his humanity that went beyond the ring, and and I don't know exactly how to explain it. That when it was more than that, Doc. What do you? Well, think? the people that know him best say that he was very uneducated, as, as you've already noted, but that he was actually a very intelligent man. And it's usually the people usually talk about his sense of humor, his mm-hmm. ability to come back in witty ways and to uh, string together things. Well, like like his poetry, yeah. that it really takes quite a mind to be able to do that. But he didn't have the kind of mind that could grapple with uh, mathematics problems. Spelling was an issue. Writing was an issue Reading for him. Was Reading was a huge issue. Um, but I agree. I think that one of the things that was very interesting about him was that he actually was in a sport. Uh, that was very racially divided. Mm-hmm. He, and he was one of those, uh, there were any number of them, who felt that uh, for black men fighting, and there were a lot of them at the time, you know, this is really, the, he comes in and ushers in what, for my mind, is the end of boxing. Boxing pretty much ends after him, except for maybe some of the welterweights. You, but the Foreman, the Frasers, the Ali's, the big guys, they, they really don't exist anymore. That was pretty much the end. Well, Tyson of, had, a, had, a, had a possibility of that. Tyson bit a man's ear. He went off the rail. Yes, he went off the he went off the rail. He was he's the exclamation point at the end of the heavyweight boxers. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure. But my point is that he was he was in a sport where um, where black men largely were being used and abused uh, by by whites. And this is oh yeah, this is a big deal. Well, Sonny Liston was probably the epitome of that. Exactly. Really. And so it happened that um, you know as the with the rise of the. Uh, uh, National Organization of Islam, is that what I'm saying, NOI, that he joined? Nation uh, of, or of Nation of Islam, of Islam, not National Organization. Yeah. Uh, the Nation of Islam, um, going back through the Malcolm X days, uh, he 
uh, actually um, gained a lot of notoriety just by joining that organization. And he developed, there was a real love for him among his own, among his own race at that point, mm -hmm. and a lot of disdain for him among the white races. But what's funny is over time, the way he spoke about the black man's plight really drew a lot of whites to him. I mm -hmm. know that when I used to listen to him talk, mm -hmm. and he didn't talk a lot, but when he talked about the struggle of the black man and his name being a slave name, Cassius Clay, and the way he changed his name and why, it really hit a chord with me. Mm -hmm. And that may be a piece of it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think so too. We, and uh, and even you know, the, a lot of people will want to will critique him about being a draft dodger, but uh, he <clears throat> he at the time accepted the faith, and he said that that faith prohibited him from from doing that. And, mm -hmm. and and even though he may not have known much about it, I mean, he studied it much more after that. He was a disciple of Elijah Muhammad, really much more so than Malcolm X or or or. Um, yeah, uh, any of the others that would follow, uh, but uh, it was a it was a, a exclamation that I'm going to take this seriously. I may not know much now, but I'm going to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. And he 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 rejected millions of dollars to go fight elsewhere, you know, in order to stay and the uh, largely in Chicago he lived and and uh, and fight this battle. I well, that, yeah. I, I, I mean, his passport was taken away from him, so he couldn't couldn't really go. He was uh, he was it was a felony what he they charged him with and all of that. But you know, it's funny because I, I grew up through that time, and um, I remember as a kid, you know, there were there were sports heroes before that. Sure, but the acclaim that came to them was not from themselves right mickey mantle would be a good example right, right. and roger maris right. Right. and and uh you know the at the football athletes and and uh, all of that you know so as and i was you know kind of in athlete in training mm -hmm. you know growing up going right. through all the minor you know the little leagues and all that kind of stuff and so you looked for heroes and and here comes cassius clay and he was he was an incredible uh, athlete and olympian I mean, mm -hmm. he won the Olympics a light, in boxing. Light heavyweight, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he was a, an accomplished athlete. But then, I mean, you know, it was kind of like the transition. Since Cassius Clay, we now have self-proclaimed star athletes. Mm-hmm. You know, that used to be in football, you know, the, the you caught the pass in the end zone and you didn't do your end zone dance you just sort of dropped the ball gave it to the referee right. and went off and and the acclaim right. came from the announcers and the people and all of that the hero worship came mm -hmm. from them and Cassius Clay you know when he started saying I'm the greatest I mean it was a whole new phenomena in sports you yeah. know and for a lot of us you know that were watching this happen it, it was, was a shock it was amazing yeah. <laughs> to see this guy and uh, and he and he was just a you know, a, a kind of a kid starting out, and then he, we watched him go yeah. through all that he went through. It was it was a really a fascinating thing, and and so I, you know, I, I would say you can sort of trace back to mm -hmm. him that self promotion mm -hmm. that he did that has sort of taken over athletes now. Well, you know, one of athletics. His, one of his quotes was, uh, uh, "I had said I was the greatest before I knew I was." <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, but uh, but the the I think what makes this interesting and go back to a couple of the articles that uh, we were reviewing here too is uh, not only um, how he became uh, in that neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, one article that's in the uh, Voice of America uh, website talks about him and how he lived with his first wife and there were uh, there, there there's house was firebombed and and there were there were some other things that went on. But he he stayed around. That neighborhood, and 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 again, in that st stance that he took, that went to the Supreme Court, and eventually came out in his favor as a conscientious objector. But um, all through that time, he um, he kept learning, kept trying to quest for faith, and I think that being a seeker is something that probably I admired because I was going through my own, probably uh, questioning, uh, wondering about faith. We're wondering where that stood, and don't we all look in a, uh, from our pulpits today and say, "I wish our folks would take it as seriously." Mm -hmm. I mean, 
His uh, the uh, the article that's from uh, BeliefNet uh, from one of his daughters that talks about his quest, his spiritual quest, <clears throat> dropping the Nation of Islam, and uh, then he he uh, took on a more uh, ascetic uh, role and or or faith in the Sun in Sunni and Sufi. Uh, Doc, you understand that probably a little bit more than I do. Well, he, they're the two main branches of Islam, uh, Sunni and Shia. By, Sunni is by far and away the largest, probably 85% of all Muslims are Sunni. And he, and that's the more moderate. When we think of ISIS, we think of Shiites. When mm-hmm. we think of Saudi Arabia royal family, we think of Sunni. He became a Sunni Muslim and uh, began attending, began doing his five-time-a-day prayer, but uh, soon I uh, found the writings of one particular ascetic whose name escapes me, and I probably couldn't pronounce it if I had it. And he began reading his work, and he was a what's called a Sufi. And a Sufi is a, 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 not a sect of Islam per se, but it is an internalization of Islam, I think is the way they describe it. It's a, a searching for the truth, that seeking you were talking about, Ben, mm-hmm. that seeking and searching for the truth uh, in in the inner man, looking for some kind of a light inside the body that represents the God. And he uh, took very seriously this writing and took out a very contemplative uh, and ascetic lifestyle, which he maintained until he died. Uh, and we're talking about the uh, passing of Muhammad Ali today on Faith Matters here on the talk station. And one other article just real quickly that mentioned about um, uh, Muhammad Ali in light of the beginning of Ramadan says that it is imperative that Christians pray for Muslims during these days when they are most open to God. So just on that note, we'll be back in just a moment here on Faith Matters. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with uh, Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Robert Cornegy. And uh, another article that we want to talk to, uh, Robert, you brought this one to us. It's uh, from the Denison Forum on Truth and Culture. It's called Thousands of Atheists in D.C. for a Reason Rally. Uh, Over the weekend, an expected 30,000 atheists descended onto the National Mall in D.C. to rally for reason, though estimates have it that roughly 15,000 at best participated. The Reason Rally sought to celebrate the secular movement in America and give voice to their desire for more reason and less religion in government. Hosted by United Secular Americans organization, the rally featured speakers such as Bill Nye, the science guy, comedian Penn Jellett of Penn and Teller fame, and Method Man from Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever said that before on the radio. Uh, so, um, uh, but um, this is a uh, Robert. You, you brought this to us, and you said that uh, this is an annual event. That oh uh, uh, yeah, it's been doing it. They've been doing it for a few years. But the uh, it's a uh, we have a number. You know, I'm I'm involved with a um, an apologetics Christian apologetics uh, movement on college campuses, and I'm I'm involved with one at East Carolina, and we. Um, mm-hmm. We um, and and they're all over the country, and so a lot of the the people that went to the to this event also um, attend college. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, it, yeah, that's or they teach at colleges. Yeah. Are they? Uh, they're involved somehow. Well, maybe in the University the, of Miami is recruiting their new chair there. Right? Exactly. Right. It's there. they're somehow. We we still call it higher education, but we may have to we may have to put air quotes around uh, higher from when we talk about it anymore. Yeah. But anyway, the point is, um, a lot of a, a, a good percentage of those fifteen thousand that showed up, um, I guarantee, were not atheists. They were Christians who were there to engage the atheists in their positions. This is a great. So a lot of the chapters around yeah. the country of Rosho Christi, which means the reason of Christ, um, go there mm-hmm. to practice their trade, if you will, of defending the Christian faith. Well, you know, let me let me go back. We just talked about Muhammad Ali, and one of the things that uh, that we did not get to, but in, the, in, in essence we kind of talk about when we talk about praying for Muslims during Ramadan, is that uh, the, the, the Muslim re, uh, re faith is about a works idea of earning your way. That's right. And, and so it becomes about, is, is very self-centered, 
Uh, so, uh, so, and atheism shares a lot of that. Uh, exactly. The idea is that uh, it's all about me. And, That's right. And it's about what I can do. That's right. And so, but that means there is an opportunity to, to speak about something more. Well, you know, we've got to reinforce these and take advantage of these op- op- opportunities for conversation mm-hmm. w- when we have different positions. And, and to be able to do it, to speak the truth, as we would say, as the Bible says with um, Peter said it, to be prepared to give, an, to give a reason mm-hmm. for the hope that is within you. And to do it with gentleness and respect, and so so that's what we train college students to be able to do is to be able to confront these things. So this the reason rally is always a great opportunity to uh, go and talk to these folks and help them think through some of the consequences, because uh, you know obviously atheism is sort of a self defeating um, argument when you when you pit it against. Christianity, they're claiming that Christians are unreasonable Mm -hmm. and that atheism is reasonable. Well, I'm sorry. There, there are there's some very reasonable elements of Christianity. I mean, and and of 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 God, of faith. Isaiah, come, let us reason together. I mean, there is this opportunity to love God not just with your heart and your soul and your strength, but to love Him with your mind. Mm. Right, exactly. To transform your mind yes. by the re- renew yes, it by the washing yeah. of the word. You know, I mean, this is this is really we don't. You know, we're kind of coming out of that age of anti-intellectualism, and uh, in the church, and it's really exciting to see it, and uh, it's almost like a renaissance of thought. So, so for for them to set up the straw man argument, mm-hmm. it's a false argument that. That if you're atheist, you're reasonable. If you're Christian, you don't do reason. We do reason, but we know that revelation is a part of it as well. Truth is composed of spirit and truth, of reason and uh, revelation. So. One of one of the interesting uh, arguments I always like to to engage in is then love certainly is not reasonable. I mean, if you by your definition of uh, of what is reason, then then love cannot exist. Uh, b- That's right. See, so, they 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 basically um, you know squared the circle, mm-hmm. and they've said that if it can't be tasted, if it can't be smelled, if it mm-hmm. can't be seen, if it can't be heard, if it's not sensually perceived, then it's not real. Yeah, which is interesting, uh, Doc, because this is also an age where where feelings <laughs> have become the political watchword, and this is a political movement too. Well, what's really interesting is the is HB two. Yeah, I mean, it, all these folks want it both ways, mm-hmm. and I'm not referring to the bathroom here. Yeah, they want it. <laughs> they want it so that there's so that reason is reason trumps everything, and yet and so it has to be touched or seen or it has to be visually uh, identified, and yet. I can go to the bathroom without visual identification at all. It's based on how I feel about something and how I how I self identify how, how, how I identify myself today. So it's 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 both and on two really bizarre fronts that don't ever seem to have a point of convergence, and yet they seem to hold them in balance with no problem. And that's where liberalism is going right now to the point of reason and to the point of. No reason. Right, exactly. But they can't see a mystery of faith as being at all reasonable, no. <laughs> which is, seems, seems to be just uh, well, you ironic. Know, the, the, the fascinating yeah. thing is these, these apostles of reason, mm-hmm. are, they'll be the first to tell you that everything is predetermined by science. I mean, it's all chemicals. And, I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a kind of a crude reference, but that we're human beings are just kind of meat machines. You know, we just all we ones just, and zeros. Yeah, it's really. binary and mm-hmm. it's all chemical. And you just you don't really think. You just think you think. Yeah. <laughs> it's an illusion in your mind. And yet they come out and say, Oh yeah, we're the big you know. But see again, this is this of, is the of, church's this is the church's challenge. It has been for as long as I've been a part of it, at least and probably before that, and that is simply that God actually does miracles in the world. He does things that are unreasonable, unattained. I mean, you can't even put our minds around what he does. When I watch him heal somebody overnight of a cancer, or I see him mend a part of a person's body, or raise the dead, 
I mean, this is something that is unreasonable. There's no way that I can see, touch, feel my way to that explanation. And yet, the visual, the actual reality of it is right there in front of me. Yeah. That's been since the creation of the world. That's why you can't be a realist and believe that the world was created by God either. And yet he does these things which we can't see, the results of which we can. It's Yeah, I love the way John Lennox put it. He said he was John he went, Lennon? Lennox. John Lennox. Lennox. Yes. He's a mathematician <laughs> philosopher from England. And he was debating uh Christopher Hitchin. And uh, they had this go at, it. and his and Hitchin is uh, was one. Of, he's he's dead now, but and he's he's figured it out. But uh, <laughs> he was he's kind of the new atheist guy. You know, he was the go to guy. And they were debating, and and um, at, as when uh, Hitchens got through with his description of God, uh, Lennox said to him, "Well, you know, Christopher," he said, "if my God was the God that you just described." I wouldn't believe in him either. Mm-hmm. That's not the God that we worship because they set up a false God and then straw man God and then tear him down. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not our God. Right. And right. so, right. you know, we don't worship. I agree with the atheists. If that's the way God is, I'm not going to worship mm-hmm. him either. Mm-hmm. He, that's not the God that I worship. I worship it. And most of these guys really don't know. The God that we – they obviously don't know him. That They're lacking that experience. Exactly. And, th- and that's my point. That's the church's challenge in the nutshell. The church is not, is, is not effectively leading people toward the miraculous of God. We are not sharing our miraculous testimonies. We're not, uh, we're not ushering other people into the presence of God so they can have their own testimonies. Because the, the one thing that we know about this, is, about this whole thing is once you have seen God work somewhere, there's no one that will convince you that he does not exist. Once you see him, once he heals you miraculously, once he raises a family member up, once he makes an alcohol, you know, an alcoholic stop drinking overnight, once he does something remarkable in your life, you go, wow, this guy is the real deal. And And that is why the early church was willing to suffer and die and be tortured to death and not give up their faith because they had a testimony. They had seen what happened. They had actually seen Jesus raised. They had seen the miracles that happened. They had evidence. And the church needs to provide evidence, and we don't do it because right. because we, the church, have also become the church of reason. Well, it's both. We are reason. It's spirit and truth. We don't. That's the way we. That's what Jesus said. The people that will follow me will worship me in spirit, and they will worship me in truth. They will worship me with their whole bodies, Mm -hmm. completely, with their minds, they'll worship me, with their strength, with their hearts and their souls, they will worship me. You can't set a category aside. It's got to be all of the above. It's not a multiple choice But we've taken the the unseen out, is what I'm saying to you. It's got to be both. It's right, and we take the unseen out. It has to be both. It's not one or the other. You ask, ask, look at any book on churches today, what needs to happen, and they'll tell you all the things that people need to see, all the things they need to feel all the things they need to hear when they come in the thing as well as the Re- uh, lewis said it best he said they haven't had the revelation experience and that's what they have to have something the unseen. revelation experience last word more to come in a moment here on faith matters on the talk station Welcome back to Faith Matters on the Talk Station. I'm Ben Ball, along with Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Robert Cornegy. Another uh, article that came out this week, I want to talk about, kind of dovetail into from our other discussions as well. And this is, comes from, actually from AOL, um, which I didn't know was still around, actually. <laughs> but uh, uh, this article came out uh, this week called, the Christians, Jews, and Muslims United to Help Syrian Refugee Family uh, Act Abraham's children together as a group of Muslims and Christians and Jews coming together specifically to help refugees from Syria come to Canada, said Rabbi Stephen Wise. Uh, so basically about 18 months ago, I called up my friend Mokar, who happens to be a minister in the United Church, and my friend uh, Stephen, who was a rabbi at the synagogue, and said, look, guys, let's have breakfast together and talk about the Syrian crisis. 
From that came an idea that they would get their congregations together and together sponsor a Syrian uh, family, a Syrian refugee family, to come to Canada. Since then, they have had uh, a number of other uh, families that they've sponsored and brought together. Uh, but uh, this is a, an ecumenical movement uh, that's beyond what a lot of people think of. Uh, and, uh, um, Doc, what, what do you think as far as this is? Uh, is this a possibility? Is this a model for maybe um, interfaith uh, uh, cooperation of some sort? Golly, I think this is a model that has been around for a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. we really only need to walk through our community here in the Moorhead City area and look at the uh, the various uh, non-governmental organizations, the helping organizations here, to see that those are actually the perfect breeding grounds for ecumenical or inter cross denominational relationships. Uh, very every, very nearly everywhere, from uh, the pregnancy center to Hope Mission, our 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 studies in what it looks like when communities come together. What makes this one, I guess, no, newsworthy is the act part of it, the uh, mm -hmm. Abraham's children aspect, the fact that it's crossing not only denominations but entire faiths. But again, uh, I think this is something that's been around for a long time. In fact, in Canada, this isn't the first example of that. When I, when I had churches in the greater Toronto area, uh, they had already engaged in refugee uh, relief. This is... Mm -hmm. maybe 10, 12 years ago, in refugee relief, uh, largely for Vietnamese families. Uh, mm -hmm. And those were all uh, cross-cultural uh, help groups. Well, there's a group here, Interfaith Refugee Ministry exactly, out of New Bern yeah. that does that. And uh, we helped uh, sponsor a, a Vietnamese family once. And uh, there's a little, little Methodist church uh, in this area that sponsored a number of Burmese uh, and uh, and that that became a huge uh, part of their community. I mean, the church was really um, very small, uh, older church, and uh, they they brought in a great vitality to the church now. So, um, but this um, is this special, uh, Robert. I mean, you've traveled the world and uh, and and done that with and and experienced in different faiths and uh, people coming together on the on the mercy ship, for example. You said it was a big uh, accumulation of. Uh, different Christian uh, followers. Correct. Yeah, that was Christian denominations. Yeah. I, well, it follows that vision that has always been a part of our faith that, um, you know, we're not just an a la carte opportunity. We have different mm -hmm. choices, but we're really moving to the melting pot. Mm -hmm. where we come together and share together the uh, different aspects of our faith. And, and uh, so I'm excited to see that happen. There, there are places where that can happen, and Canada is a good place that that needs to happen, quite frankly, because Canada is going through a real cultural shift as they sort of break apart and they're going into their little specialties. So to be able to come together and have a big meal at the table of all these different influences, I think that's – that's commendable. So, um, and it's monotheism at its best, isn't it? All the the three monotheistic religions that worship right. the, Abraham as a part, Father Abraham, is uh, it's great to see that. You know, I have to say though, right after nine eleven happened, uh, I interviewed. Uh, I didn't know this organization, Care. You know that we have come to know a little bit more of. At the Islamic um, Relations uh, Committee on American and Islamic Relations, I think is what it's called. Um, and I interviewed somebody from there. And I mentioned, say, well, we have Abraham in common. Um, if that didn't go over well, real well. Uh, as the idea of that we actually could have something that we could work together peacefully. And this is right after this horrific event. Mm -hmm. I was trying to look for some common ground. Uh, and they, they weren't taking that. Uh, here is though uh, people who are not people in charge of any committee. They're not not they they are local. They're on the street, and and they're taking it. Uh, they're taking it uh, over. And uh, isn't that to maybe the essence of um, of where this comes about? Don? Kind of grassroots. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. That is the whole point right there. The church is. Um, is hierarchical at every level. It doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or Methodist, mm -hmm. uh, Episcopal denominations, but you know we're, we're we're hierarchical as Baptists and as and as Pentecostals too. But my point is, when you get to the very top of the 
of the hierarchy of the church, mm-hmm. and these kinds of opportunities come, the hierarchy loves to talk about them. But things actually happen at the grassroots level. That's why I'm a huge fan of developing like-minded ministries for people at the grassroots level and keeping the pastors and the hierarchy out of it. Because generally speaking, you know, when a neighborhood comes together after a, a flood or a hurricane down here, right. there's really no conversation about you know, who you are, what yeah. your job is, or anything like that. Right. At our basic level, at the grassroots level, we will always find something to come together about. And that's this. we don't want to confuse this story. This story is a small group of grassroots people. This isn't big denominations coming together. Correct. Big denominations and come together. At the this world. isn't top down. They, this is bottom individual up. Individual con- congregations that are doing it. Yeah. Well, and it was pastors and rabbis and, and mullahs, you know, that are doing that. But, um, yeah, it's it's – in in aiding people that are in hardship, you know, look, that's that's where we can have find common ground. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like, for instance, you know, Mercy Ships is a interdenominational ministry, and and we, you know, we are there for a purpose. It's to serve the, the needy, the poorest of the poor, and so that kind of draws us. We can we can agree on that. Now, you know, we have all kinds of different perspectives. And um, but um, but this perspective, but this particular issue of Syrian refugees has uh, been a, a caused a firestorm in the U.S. Though mm-hmm. because of whether or not uh, you know they're going to be properly vetted, whether or not uh, they are they are truly uh, truly refugees or they're terrorists in hiding. Uh, and the, the church here, these uh, this Canadian group, seems to have moved beyond that. Uh, and found at least I don't know how their families are getting chosen, how that's coming about. If it's the same way, similar to how Interfaith Refugee Ministry works through the State Department vetting process, so I don't know how that works. But it appeared from the article that they were already here, and they just picked them up. They weren't newly arrived. They weren't newly arrived. It said that they had arrived earlier, and so they just adopted basically this family to help them mm-hmm. settle in. And, and acclimate to the to the new environment. So I don't think they got into the that part of it. I know, you know. what was interesting. Uh, I know in our experience with a Vietnamese family was that we were told it would take about a year for them. The same in this article about a year for them to acclimate, et cetera, get driver's licenses, you know, to do those, enter into language right. courses, et cetera. Uh, and uh, and but often uh, after six months or eight months, they warned us they may move on because they may move to other communities where there are other Vietnamese. Right. Uh, they didn't. They stayed. Hmm. They stayed for a couple of years, at least two, three years, I think, uh, before they did eventually move to some other family. So there's opportunities again for churches and it's around us to do that. Yeah. To do something similar. Yeah. Kindness to strangers. That's that's a that's a big part of our faith, isn't it? That we we embrace them when they come in. Now, you know, the question is, you know, you don't want to get into the political part of it, but well, you know, but you can't escape it. Yeah, I mean, you, there, there is going to be, and and within congregations, uh, and I think rightly so. I mean, you always have to have the voice that's going to question, that's going to ask the hard questions, right? About whether or not this is going to be, this is going to work out. Or is this, or is this, or are we just bring in somebody who's going to turn on us? Right. So, how do how do you answer that as a church? Do you do you not worry about that? You put that all in God's hands and say this is this is what we're doing. I, I like uh, Reagan's trust but verify mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> position that that they need to be properly vetted. They need to go through the process, mm-hmm. and then once once they're in on the ground. And, you know, again, this is that thing. Or why are they coming here? Are they coming here to be a, to join us in the American family, the melting pot? Or are they coming here for another reason, to be distinct, to be mm-hmm. separate? And, um, you know, that's where it used to be our immigration policies were all to bring them in wow. and everyone becomes an American. And we share that, that we're all, you know, oh, that, we're all immigrants. You know, but we've seen that change, even as official policy in in our yeah. immigration. Well, even in our department. earliest days, though, we ghettoized uh, uh, different groups into different parts of neighborhoods, and especially in big cities. Uh, yeah, so. but it's interesting. You mentioned about the Vietnamese maybe going to where there were other Vietnamese. There's a there's a level of that that's always going to happen in there, where your your affinity group you're gonna you're gonna gravitate towards people that 
are like you and that kind of thing. So you sort of self Mm -hmm. segregate for a while, but the idea, and it usually takes a generation or two before the, a lot of that is, uh, is gone. I think the big change in this country is at one point there was a great big fire burning under our melting pot. There was something here that was remarkable. Mm -hmm. And over time uh, we have become frankly less remarkable and we have politicians now that are calling us even less than less remarkable. In fact, there's nothing special about the United States at all, according to our mm-hmm. our current resident in the White House. And as that fire gets turned down, the pot melts less and less, and the amalgam is formed uh, less frequently. And until this country, uh, to quote Uncle Don, until it gets great again and the heat gets turned up, I think we continue to divide and not melt. We replaced the uh, fire with a solar reflector. And that was a, that's, a, that's the problem. <laughs> okay, or that. <laughs> we'll have uh, more to come in a moment on Faith Matters on the talk station. And welcome back to our final segment today on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240, along with Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Robert Cornegay. I'm Ben Ball, and thanks for joining us here today. Let's take a look at one more article. This is from Christianity Today and the Exchange blog, Ed Stetzer writing, Three Church Methods That Need to Change. Uh, he starts out by saying, it's, it's long been said that the last seven words of a church are, we've never done it that way before. Uh, the effect of holding on to bad tradition, bad habits, and bad strategy is ineffective evangelism, stagnation, and eventually death. How can churches avoid uh, holding on to mechanisms, strategies, traditions, and the like past their expiration date? How can churches be constantly effective in reaching their communities? Well, let's start with the premise, first of all. Are you okay with this premise, uh, Robert, that uh, churches have uh, too many of our churches are, are stuck stuck in a rut you know that's that's a popular thought isn't it Mm -hmm. that we just this is the way we've always done it you know forget about it new ideas we don't need them this is you know you just keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results that's actually called insanity Mm -hmm. i understand so yeah it's important that you bring some change in and uh our culture you know if you're a lot of the pastors that are uh, in pulpits today went through their seminary training in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And the seminary of the 70s is a, and the way the church was structured at that time is very different than the seminaries and structure of the church today. And so, yeah, they, you know, I'm, I believe that change is good. Mm-hmm. I believe that as long as you're not doing it just to change. Just to change. Yeah. As long as there's a, a calling and a motivation from God to refine the way you, you serve the people, then then okay, that let's let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. But just to just to change, just to entertain, mm-hmm. you know, that seems to be one of the changes that took place. You know, we became a professional yeah, worship certainly out of the 70s thank yeah you. and uh, so all of that you know is we're seeing changes away from that now and going back to hymns and mm-hmm. and different things so yeah it's it's um, always in flux so i'd say yeah there's a there's a temptation not to change but i think we have to challenge that um, when we feel god moving us in another direction one of the uh, he he points out basically three different uh, uh, areas. One is consider scattering over gathering. Uh, why not push more of the for, uh, functions of the church to the periphery of the church, including the amount of times uh, that we gather? Let me just start there. I, I, I'm assuming that means doing doing more outside of the walls of the church and more than just on Sunday morning. Is that uh, is that how you see that, Doc? Yes, All that, right. that's and, exactly. I, I I know Ed very well. Mm-hmm. And the thing about poor Ed is Ed Stetzer is such a great guy, and we do a lot of his articles on the show. We, we bump into him over and over and over because he is a prolific writer. Because when you when you do what Ed does for a living, you have to keep generating new ideas and new, you know, the, the, next, the next great plan, right? <laughs> That's right. And uh, every once in a while, you know, Ed will hit on something really fantastic. Uh, this actually, this one of the three ideas he has here might be one of his better ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea that the uh, 
the, the, the drawing together of people has been the focus of the church for a long time and that the sending out of people and the gathering in the community. I'm now going back all the way to St. Francis. I'm going all the way back to St. Patrick, particularly if you think about Patrick's model, the missionary society model, the mm-hmm. idea where you were in an abbey, but then you actually went out into the community and you did your services there and you did your visits in your hospitals and all of that. That, I think, is a, is a very profoundly good model for the church today, and it's something, in fact, that we've been trying to do now for the last year or two by developing our missionary organizations, our art organizations, that actually don't meet at the church. They actually mm-hmm. meet in other places, are cross-denominational, and they and they happen at what Ed calls the periphery. Fantastic, wonderful idea. Wish everyone could do it. I think one of the fad movements I've seen, and I call it that because I wonder if it if it uh, has has legs to it, is to take a Sunday away from worship and go and do and go and do projects. You know, be a variety of them, maybe maybe a half a dozen different ones, but they all take place on a Sunday. Uh, I I kind of I sort of leaned away from that one uh, just because I feel like we it, we it, it's not it's replacing scattering replacing gathering with scattering instead of. They need to oh, in addition the, to yeah, in, so in, in addition, addition to yeah, but more than that, that's why God gave us Monday through Saturday. Yes, that's <laughs> right. exactly. We kind of already have six of those. Yeah, so good. that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we are to assemble and worship God collectively. That's a big part of that. Although we can worship God in so many different ways, that's one of the sort of the traditions is that we can only worship God within the four walls of the church. And, you know, this is, this is kind of that new thought that's coming out. No, we can actually go out and worship God through service to others. Sur- worship isn't just singing songs. It's more than that. And mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah, getting out into the community. And, and, you know, we found with our youth, we have, for, for years, we would go to a, you know, where a hurricane or some disaster had gone through and our youth team would go in and work with, mm-hmm. with those kind of things. And we, and we still do that, but, but now every, every so often we will throw in a sort of, um, staycation, <laughs> stay right. at home right. where we go into the community mm-hmm. and we do community service and we work in that with the group, with the teens and, and, uh, they really enjoy that. So, uh, there are lots of ways to, to scatter. Yes. His second uh, one that he brings up is consider how to use pathways. And what he defines as pathways is a strategy when a church moves from people from sitting in rows to sitting in circles. Simple re- rearrangement is a means of changing members from consumers to participants. This really comes from the idea of, uh, of uh, it's a really a technological idea of push technology versus pull technology, et cetera. So, so that um, uh, you, you have something that's more of a chat room than it is of a, uh, of a lecture. <laughs> Uh, so what do you think about that pathway or that idea of creating those pathways? It's not really new, though. Oh, no. In fact, even in the Catholic Church back in the 70s and 80s, they were beginning to build circular mm-hmm. That's right. uh, sanctuaries. I remember a very dear friend of mine had one uh, up in Ohio. The first church that I actually planted, we uh, we met in an octagonal barn, and mm. we had no – we really didn't have any other option. The church was growing quickly, and to make use of the space, we had to sit in a three-quarter round. And sitting in that three-quarter round is a completely different dynamic. But it's like a lot of other things. Your, the, the seven last words of the church, mm-hmm. I'm saying. If you take a church and say, starting next week, we're going to sit in a circle, that's a challenge. If you start a church in a circle, that's a different thing. It's a really hard change to make midstream. It's a really great way to start something out. Yeah. But what about also the idea of the pathway being the small group? That meets, you know, the, uh, the the groups that meet uh, in, separate from Sunday worship. Yeah, even. it's interesting. Our life group meets in a circle. Mm-hmm. We we uh, we circle up. Our Sunday school is more of a. It's very interactive. It's but it's uh, it's much more of a traditional sit and row kind of thing mm-hmm. with with the leader up front. But um, um, you know, there there are, and and we were, we started the life group that way. Mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the circle like yeah. you said that right. that that I agree with that but um um and it also depends on the leadership of whether type of leadership type yeah. of leadership right. that you're that you're working with which is the third point well let's talk about this third point here too because this one is probably the most difficult one to kind of wrap your head around the the clergy uh, the clergification uh, of ministry that's a made up word here i think uh but it is the idea of getting away from clergy led 
uh, ministry. Uh, I know we talk about often in the in the Methodist Church about being baptized into ministry. About um, and and certainly I bring it up from time to time, saying that I'm not the only one here in the room yeah. uh, that that we are all to be ministers of Christ. So is this is this this again isn't new? It just maybe is a change of scene, change of emphasis, perhaps. The best clergy that I know are always about. Uh, empowering ministers to do ministry. The worst clergy I know are the clergy who try to do everything themselves. So from a matter of self-preservation, following a biblical model, and accomplishing the most possible and effective stewardship of time and resources, it's always better for a pastor. It's what Jesus did. It's the training of the Twelve. Mm-hmm. There were lots of people hanging around Jesus, but he emphasized on 12, put his emphasis on 12, and then he super emphasized Peter, James, and John, an mm-hmm. inner circle of three. I think that is a classic model for a pastor, and I wish more pastors did that. Most of us and most of our congregations view what we do as this is, this is your job. Right. This is what you do. And then we view it, well, this is my job, so I've got to do everything. But I have always understood my job to be to raise up and empower and, and mentor the people that are actually leading the ministries in the church. Is that what, that's what you do. That's you what play. we do, yeah. And I use a sports analogy, which we always seem to come back to. But I, I, I consider myself as a pastor, you know, that my job, the, the Ephesians – position that God has given certain gifts right and and right. the pastor teacher is is the mm-hmm. gift is one of those gifts and that my job is to um, equip the saints for the work of the ministry mm-hmm. okay so I'm I'm like a coach I, I'm a player coach because I play as well but the team it the the team that goes on the field is the is the church it's not the one sitting up in the not the spectators sitting up in the stands. Mm-hmm. A lot of churches seem to think they're the spectators in the stands and they got their pastor down on the field and he's the playing master. the game. Or the ringmaster. Yeah, yes, ring. and it's not that at all. You know, the, yeah. the team are those sitting in the pew. And so, we, you know, to be able to, to um, convey that vision to them is such an important thing. We invite you to join us next week on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Again, I'm Ben Ball. Thanks to Robert, uh, Reverend Robert Cornegan and Bishop Doc Loomis. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. Give me faith. Trust what you is a production of the talk station.